Prince, I do want to take you up a little bit on your, your, your claim that it's the ANC that's got us here, right? To an extent I agree, and to an extent I don't. There, is, there was a survey undertaken by the ANC before NASRAC, a few months before NASRAC, that showed that most of its members, so regions and mem branches and members, wanted Jacob Zuma and the entire NEC at the time to resign. And then you consider what the ANC has been in the past while in government. So the ANC of, of Tabu and Beki was very different to the ANC of Jacob Zuma, right? Um, doesn't that suggest there could actually be renewal in the ANC one day, in that the ANC is made up of far more than the people who control structures now? It's technically made up of members. And if most of those members then wanted the people around Jacob Zuma to go, surely that would suggest there is scope for renewal in the party? <coughs> okay, let me first agree with Anne. Uh, I have a building somewhere in a village called Mahushu. There's a fellow who has, who's renting my building. He's selling uh, motor parts. But nobody has called me and said, hello, business. So, <laughs> so when people think of business, they don't think of chaps like, like me. So there's nothing called business because these chaps are competing themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you say government, you may think of Sil Ramaphosa. If you call it Sil Ramaphosa, you have, you have called the South African government. But business, the whole cacophony of, let me drop that. Renewal in the ANC. The ANC, by the way, um, and you said that we fear to confront the problem. I don't fear to confront the book. We wrote a book, Stephen, you know it. The fall of the ANC, what next? And people thought we were mad. So we, we confront the problem. There is absolutely no way the ANC can renew. I'll tell you why. The mentality of an ANC politician as we speak is to enrich himself using the colors of the ANC, period. I don't care who says what, I know it. For every ANC politician. The average politician. I mean, think of a chap who joins the ANC in a village. Let me give you a, I'll, I'm going to be dramatic about it, and it's true. <laughs> There's a friend of mine who's a provincial leader. I'm not going to tell you where, of the ANC. So I've got friends all over. <laughs> so I sit. <laughs> so we're having a private chat with the fail. I said to the chap, tell me, it was, it, this discussion took place following the march that the ANC uh, conducted to the Gulman Goodman Gallery, that uh, spear, spear thing, spear. right? I was shocked. Within a week, that whole thing was put together. Buses from all over. So I said to the chap, just explain to me how it works. How do you get these mobs? Where do you collect them? <laughs> when you want them, you just go collect. I mean, surely, tell me the mechanics of it. <laughs> this is how he explained to me. He said, he showed me villages. He said, do you know our villages? I said, yes, I know. He said, those people are unemployed. When we tell them, that there's a bus that is coming to your village. It's going to take you to Johannesburg. We're going to give you a t-shirt and we're going to give you streetwise too. <laughs> Do you think those people won't climb the bus? That's how he answered my question. So even the villager thinks that way when he sees, he or she sees the colors of the ANC that I'm gonna get onto the bus, I'm gonna get streetwise too, I'm gonna get go to Johannesburg. So the chap at the, who is at a higher level than a villager thinks I'm going to get a job in the municipality. So if I join a party, I'm going to get a job in the municipality. The, guy, the chap at a higher level thinks I'm going to get a position in the provincial something. It goes all the way to the national level. If you remove Sir Ramaphosa, for example, right? Because he's the only, he's the only patina that, mm. that masks this whole thing. Remove him out of the picture. What do you see in the ends? It's thugs. From DD to, I've never met one person who trusts DD. <laughs> in South Africa. It's true. We all know it. So, so, Stephen, the system is so rotten. The ANC is a system of patronage. If you don't define it as such, you will entertain possibilities of renewal. But if you see it for what it is, this thing cannot renew. In order for it to be renewed, it must die and be born again. I'm not sure if that will happen. Okay. Okay. Professor Malaleka, I want you to pick this up because uh, I'm going to move away from the ANC if we can, although I don't know if we can, but let's try. Um, if that is all true, and we live in a country that is incredibly transparent, I accept your criticism of the media part of it, and, and, but, but, we st but I don't think you can deny that this is a very open country. In other words, we all know about things, right? Even the SABC is impartial and independent. <laughs> and my, the point that I'm making is that if that is the case, why have the opposition parties not filled the gap? Is it their failure or is it something else? Yeah, because the opposition parties are part of the same system. 
and, and, and that's the little extension I'll make to the argument that Prince is making. So the, the conduct that Prince is describing is a South African reality, not just an ANC reality. So you could make the same, the same argument around the EFF and around the DA, uh, for that matter. And, 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 and I, think, I think we make a mistake if we limit it only to the ANC. That's the first, the first thing. So the, the, the opposition parties are not outside of this, um, this uh, patronage system, if you like. Uh, they, they are also inside of it. And they too are trying to get in um, to, to get a piece of the cake, if you like. But, but what I want, the, the point I really want to make is that um, we, we, must not, we must not absolve South Africans of all responsibility. It's not as if we can all stand outside and point a finger at the ANC and the EFF and the DA. The psychologists have got this wonderful term uh, called dependency. There is a co-dependent relationship between South Africans and the ANC. It's a sick relationship, very well described by, by, by Prince. But it is co-dependent. There is an, there's an understanding between South Africans and the ANC. And part of the reason the media will simply adopt Cyril Ramaphosa against the ANC or vilify Zuma or adopt Mbeki and so on is also because of that co-dependency that we have. We are part of the problem, all of us. We have reached a stage as, as citizens of this country where we accept as normal these things that are happening and where we will, we will, we will go to extremes to praise Ramaphosa because he said one little good thing. At least there's a ray of hope there. But it's not, it's not just the ANC. We can't sit here and say the, the problem of South Africa is the ANC. The problem of South Africa is the codependent, sick relationship between South Africans and the ANC, just like you find the same sick relationship between uh, Ca Cameroonians and Paul Beer, just to find the same kind of sick relationship that existed between uh, Robert Mugabe and Zimbabweans for a very long time. That is the problem that we need to face. It's easy just to, to, to absorb ourselves and say, no, it's the ANC alone that is, that's the problem. ANC alone can't bring the country so close to the brink. It, it was able to do this because we are part of the problem. We let it happen. We understand it. And Tony, you represent an organization of people who presumably vote. Do you think voters are just going to sit there and be blamed as well? Or do you think that maybe we're being a little rude to voters when we, bla when we blame them for the problem? Um, I think he's, he's very right when he says that as a country, when we talk about business and we talk about employment and we talk about all of this, as young people or as youth, there's this kind of expectation that, you know, I'm going to start a business and then the government is going to fund me or someone, it's your responsibility to get up and, and sort me out. But I think the, the responsibility is definitely on both. We, can, we also have the responsibility of what the country's going through in the sense that if we are not also standing up against or for or clear about what we want as a country, or if we also decide not to vote for, for an example, then we're definitely going to have, it's definitely on us. But I think as South Africans, there's definitely an attitude of the government needs to give me this, and therefore if the government does not give me this, then I cannot move forward. And the problem there is how do we then get out of that? How do we move South Africans to thinking out of that. And I think that is that runs deeper than just voting, but it runs more deeper into what are the structures that South Africans had to grow up on, people that have grown up in poverty, and what does that do to the mindset of that? And I think that if the government could really focus on empowerment in another form than just to say, um, we'll give you money, we'll give you houses, we'll give you all of this, but actually empower them in the mind and how they actually see themselves as citizens in the country and their role in voting, then I think we would actually see a more interactive and a less dependency relationship amongst the government and the voters. And just let's see if we can, for business, get to the nub of whether there's an ANC problem or a country problem. I'm not going to ask you what it would be like for business if the EFF took over. 
But I will ask you what it would be in a, so, so the way I'll ask the question is, how different would it be for business under the DA's economic plan, for example? Would it change anything to have a different party in power? Well, let me, I want to give two examples of how I think South Africans allow the debate to focus on the wrong things, and I'll come to what you're talking about. The first is South Africa now boasts we have the world's highest antiretroviral, most largest antiretroviral program. And at one level you could say, well, well done. I want to be in a country where we are the world's leader at preventing AIDS. And that requires leadership. We also say we now give 17 and a half million the Minister of Finance said it's gone up for 500,000, 17 and a half million people grants. And we're proud of this. I would be much prouder about how many people, millions, we have got off the grant system, i.e. they don't need it anymore. So we have the wrong sort of notions about what success requires. I want a country where we are moving people out of poverty into becoming truly empowered because they have a job, they have a chance of decent education, they live in a, mainly in a city, we're nearly 70% urbanized, we will be nearly 80% in 10 years' time. They live in a city of hope and inclusion rather than an apartheid city. Then we can start talking about successes. So I think how we frame things is part of the problem. Now, I'm here in my official capacity, so I'm restrained because uh, I disagree <laughs> with um, some of what's been said here, but let me not go there. Let me talk about the EFF. <laughs> um, I personally am outraged at the following things. I'm outraged at how the media have handled the EFF from day one. Let me give you an example. The very first... A uh, public event they had was a mass rally in Sharpville. And I opened my Sunday Times, and the front page is 50,000 people at the EFF rally in Sharpville. And I think that's interesting. Sharpville is not a big place. Would they have a stadium for 50,000 people? I read the entire article, and you get to the last paragraph, and it says, the EFF claimed there were 50,000 people. When I asked the editor at the time, what was your independent estimate, as journalists should do, used to do, of the crowd? The editor said, no, we didn't do it, and no, you're right, there isn't a stadium that big, but you know, it's so exciting, and this is a new thing. <laughs> so we have a party with 6% of the electorate, which is in my view, fascist, racist, and violent. And the media, until very recently, just thought they were fun. And aren't they interesting? And uh, you did it today. Every single story you read, the media starts with, according to the EFF and the DA. Now, in a constitutional democracy, the official opposition has a constitutional position. You should start the sentence with, the DA, the official opposition, and this third party, the EFF. But nobody ever, I challenge anybody no, to show me an article that ever starts that way. So what happens in South Africa is, and you said, let's talk about the, you said them first. Now, I was making a joke uh, because. But, but this is, you know, uh, mm. I'm saying I challenge anyone to disagree with me on what is happening. So we are part of the problem of painting this organization, which I find deeply worrying for the country, in ways that exaggerate its importance up until now, and give it this patina of respectability when actually they are anti our constitution, they are intolerant, and they're all the other things I said. So, I think that's a really important part of the discourse that we better change and change fast. Because populism is growing all over the world for various reasons, and I can see, I think they're going to not do fantastically, but they will certainly go up in the election. 
Um, and also they're part of the ANC in some bizarre way. So when the president starts his State of the Nation speech by flirting with the EFF, I am deeply insulted because I support the Constitution and I don't think that's what you do. So I have some strong views, as you can hear, about the <laughs> EFF. Um, if you're asking me about the, the, the DA's mm. economic policy, as I understand it, um, so I agree, I think political parties in South Africa are weak. The ANC never made a transition from a liberation movement to a political party, which requires you to establish your values and then the policies that spring from those values and say, join us if you believe in these values, these policies, and if you don't, go and join somebody else. So they never did that, and we're seeing the consequences of that, which actually are crippling the country. But the other political parties are not strong either. I think the DA has other problems. They're struggling with growth, in fact, but they're struggling. Um, and one of the phenomena in developing countries is weak political parties, which is a problem in a democracy, because political parties are training grounds for democratic politics if they work well. You get trained in, well, what does it mean to be a this party? And how do we differ from that party in a reasonable, rational way? We don't have that in South Africa. So this is a problem, and it's, I think we should recognize the weakness of our political parties. The DA and its economic policy, as I see it, they would be, the president's talking a good game. Uh, he's now saying entrepreneurs should be heroes, and I agree with him. And we, certainly in the budget, state of the nation, and last year, he's changed the rhetoric. This is great. He should say it not just in Davos and Senton and in private gatherings that I'm not part of. He should say it in Umlazi and Polokwani and other places and explain why he thinks that. That's what a political leader should do. The DA, I think, has a consistent view to bringing the private sector into the economy much more fully. They, they want a competent state that isn't corrupt. I think they are a bit confused about certain things. Um, so I'll give you an example. I was sitting in a meeting with some of the mayors once and what they should do on economic strategy. And I said, well, you know, Chwani owns an airport. Have you thought why you should own this airport? Maybe you should sell it. Well, it was as though I'd got on the table and taken my clothes off. There was kind of, oh, mm, mm. So I don't think the DA is fully thought through, but I think there is a more consistent economic policy on both the labor issues and the role of the private sector and privatization, the P word we're not allowed to say, even as we go down the tubes. Um, so I think there would be quite a big difference. And the fact of the matter is, let me, facts matter. If you look at the Western Cape, they grew their economy. They had more jobs last year than anywhere else. They have a lower unemployment rate than anywhere else. DA governance has had an impact. It hasn't been perfect, but it has had an impact. You just have to go to the city to see that. So I think you can now talk about, it's just like, because of China and, <laughs> and Asia, it's no longer my theory versus your theory of how we move people out of poverty. There's empirical evidence of what to do, and it's been done. It's not a debate anymore. The same in South Africa, you can say where the DA has governed, I think you have seen significant movement on the economy and jobs, which needs to be part of the discussion. These are facts. Um, okay. um, we are going to go to the elections in Zondo Commission, which is where we should have started. I'm going to abuse my position and I'm going to take one minute to respond to the claims about the media and we can settle it afterwards with <laughs> principal act as referee. I'm sorry, Prince, I'm going to abuse my position sure. completely. Uh, as someone who works in the media, uh, on SFM you would not have heard about the EFF at all in the budget today. Um, so, you know, don't, don't, don't do what you accuse people of doing around business. Um, secondly, I would say... <laughs> 
if you're going to make, if people are going it's, to make comments it's about, oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> if people are going to make comments about what journalists <laughs> used to do, my response would be back when business leaders were ethical. Do you mean? Um, and I would also need to just say that it is wrong to blame the media for society's problems. Mm. We are reporting on a story, not in a sensational way. We're reporting on a sensational story. You are talking <laughs> of 350 <laughs> years. We are talking about an economic system that's prevailed for roughly 350 years, however you want to, let's say, from the advent of colonialism. You come across one person who wants to overthrow it all in 10 years. That's sensational. It's sensational. We have to give it attention. Otherwise, what are we doing? We're abrogating our responsibility. Thank you.